the Honorable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my Honorable Colleague for sharing his time with me. Um, this is a grave matter that we're debating here, Mr. Speaker, and it goes to the credibility of this place. And in the comments that I'll make at the end, I hope we'll give pause to reflect on a situation where we have a majority government. So what is the situation we have before us, Mr. Speaker? Well, in the course of a debate on Bill C-23, which is proposing significant amendments to the Canada Election Act, and I might add uh, a number of amendments that are facing huge debate across this country, but within a vacuum of ability for Canadians to speak out. So in the course of this debate, the member for Mississauga Streetsville decided to speak twice in this place and to share certain information. And as been raised here previously, it was in the course of debate on a very significant bill to Canadians, which sets out their rights to exercise the franchise. And the member has now apologized to the House and admitted that he, misplaced, that he misled this place on observations that he personally witnessed in the use of the voucher system. Now, Mr. Speaker, why is this important? Well, because the changes to the voucher system, which the government is wanting to proceed with, which is to do away with the voucher, which frankly, right now, hundreds of thousands of Canadians, from seniors um, to First Nations to students, rely on to exercise the franchise. And we're fortunate to live in a country where everybody in society has a right to vote if they are a citizen. Well, I raise this, Mr. Speaker, on this matter because I have received, and I understand the same letters have been sent to the minister responsible for uh, this new election bill. And I received letters from the, student, the president of the Students' Union for King's University College, the president of the Students' Union for the University of Alberta Students' Union, and for the Student Association of Grant McEwen University, all three major institutions in my city. And uh, what have they relayed to myself and to uh, the Honourable Minister? That they are deeply concerned that this move to remove the voucher is going to make the, and to quote uh, uh, Siger Sidirius, who is the president of the Students' Association for King's University, that it will make the ability to vote more difficult and it seems antithetical to the inclusive democratic system developed in Canada. Uh, the president of uh, the Student Union of University of Alberta, Petros Kousmos, says voter turnout from students and youth is already relatively low in federal elections. They think it's important that the government move towards making it easier for students to vote and that they're deeply troubled that the move to remove the ability for students to vouch may have graver results in, in uh, lowering voter uh, turnout from students, not higher. Uh, the Students Association for Grant McEwen University expresses the same concerns. Students unable to provide a valid piece of identification under the Fair Elections Act are currently proposed uh, risk disenfranchise, they risk disenfranchisement. And they're asking also, calling on me, to call for the government to provide expanded consultation so they can voice their perspective. So given that the government is still refusing to allow a committee to travel to discuss this important piece of legislation, the only op opportunity to find out what's in the bill and what the issues are around the voucher system is to go on CPAC or come to Ottawa if they have the opportunity if they're studying here and observe the debate. And so what did the honorable member from Mississauga Streetsville say in this place, Mr. Speaker? Well, he said, and I quote, I have actually witnessed other people picking up the voter cards, going to the campaign office of whatever candidate they support and handing out these voter cards to other individuals who then walk into voting stations with friends who vouch for them with no ID. He said that once. Again, on February 6th, he again said, I will relate to um, him, he means the Minister of State for Western Economic Diversification, something I've actually seen on the mail delivery day when voter cards are put in mailboxes, residents come home, pick them out of the boxes, throw them in the garbage can. I have seen Campaign workers follow, pick up a dozen of them afterward and walk out. Why are they doing that? They're doing it so they can hand out those cards to other people who will then be vouched for a voting booth and vote illegally. That is going to stop. Well, Mr. Speaker, 
as is clear in the House and as the members uh, representing uh, the government side have attested to, almost three weeks later, the member for Mississauga Streetsville stands up and confesses in the House that he completely misled the House, not once, but twice. Now, how are we to be assured that Canadians following this debate manage to follow every day of this debate? And so they have learned that, in fact, this honourable member had misled the House. This is a serious matter. This is a serious bill that we are discussing, and it's absolutely imperative that factual information be brought forward. There have been many questions back and forth in question period, Mr. Speaker, about the, uh, the matters that are being proposed to change the Elections Act. A lot of concerns raised on behalf of constituents about uh, the plan to do away with the vouching system. So, Mr. Speaker, this is a very significant matter. We're talking about the very right of Canadians to exercise their democratic right to vote for the members in this place. And we have heard from young people, certainly in my city, deeply concerned about this proposed amendment. We had a member testify in the House that he personally had witnessed voter fraud with the use of vouchers, and then admit he never did any such thing. This is not simply a case where perhaps somebody had told him third hand that there might be some fraud with vouching. He actually stood in this place twice and said he personally had witnessed this and had witnessed voter fraud. Now, what's important, Mr. Speaker, is that according to our procedures, uh, the House Leader for the official opposition wrote, ma raised the question of privilege and uh, the members spoke to it and the Speaker issued a ruling and he said in issuing his ruling he had to consider three factors based on precedent. One was that it had to be proven the statement was misleading. Two, that it must be established the member making the statement knew at the time the statement was incorrect. And three, that in making the statement the member intended to mislead the House. Well, the member himself has apologized that he have done all three. But aside from that, the reason why you're here debating right now is because the Speaker made a ruling in this matter. And as the procedure goes, we do not get into this debate unless there's a prima facie case of contempt in the House. Now, you've heard a number of members state that we do not bring forward this kind of a motion lightly. And it doesn't happen very often. It certainly hasn't happened often while well, I have been in this place for more than five years. And so it seems appropriate, given the procedures of the House which are laid down in a chart in our procedural book, which is agreed to by all the members in the House. Mm -hmm. And that is that the next stage is there will be a vote in this place. Well, guess what, Mr. Speaker? What happens when you have a majority government? So we have a vestige if we're having a debate here. Uh, it's getting pretty clear. We're beginning to sense how people might vote. It may be that those on the other side might have a bit of conscience and think, this is kind of reprehensible behavior, maybe just standing up and saying, oh, gosh, I shouldn't have uh, misled the House. That's enough. Um, maybe this matter should be reserved referred to the committee and appropriate uh, response taken. There's no predetermined of what the response is. He could, for example, simply be asked to come before the bar of the House and, and apologize to the Speaker. Not, not terribly reprehensible. We're not going to lock him up behind bars and so forth. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty stunned, Mr. Speaker. Um, the members are complaining that we're taking up the time of the House on this. Gosh, wouldn't it be nice if instead we were taking up the time of deciding how many communities in Canada we're going to take uh, the proposed changes to the Election Act to so that we can actually have a debate among Canadians of how we should change the law. Um, clearly, my constituents and the youth in uh, my city have expressed their will. They would like to have a voice in this, in this statute. I think that they have a right not to be misinformed on what has happened with the vouching system. And regrettably, um, they have been given misleading information in this House. We can only hope that they have been able to follow this debate and they know that, in fact, there is not such clear evidence of fraudulent use of the voucher system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and comments? Mr. Honourable Member. I would like to come back.
Can the member hear uh, the translation now, the interpretation? Okay. Okay, carry on. So, in the three components that should be covered, the first is for third rather is particularly interesting because it says that the member had the intention to mislead the House. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, you don't want to say, if you say that a member is a liar, uh, he would say point of order and I would have to ex uh, apologize. I would have to apologize. So, to put together a strategy such as this, I think the intention had to be there. See, he, he didn't say the cards came back and people used them. He said that it happened in big, you know, in densely populated areas. And so he talked about an intent there. And according to the member then, did he knowingly do this or not? Ms. Strathcona. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. Um, I would simply have to say, Mr. Speaker, that it's not for me to determine. It's my understanding that the Speaker has so determined. There is a prima facie case, otherwise we would not be here now debating this matter. Um, what is a particular concern to me, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not about to compare our procedural rules with the criminal code, but as a lawyer, and as the Speaker would know as, as an accomplished lawyer, in the criminal code, we've got a difference between summary conviction and indictable. What's the difference? Intent. Well, that's the difference between somebody simply being allowed to stand up and say, oh, I'm really sorry, I quoted the wrong paper, uh, my staff gave me the wrong paper, it's the bureaucrat's fault, which we hear every day. This is a case where the member has admitted to intentionally misleading the House. He never observed such a thing. And so it is, it is a matter of a much higher order, I, I would argue, sir, and I think it Therefore, our motion is appropriate, and the amendment I think the public should be able to observe. Question and comments. Questions and comments. The honourable member for Gatineau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I listened uh, attentively to my colleague's comments, who is an eminent lawyer, and indeed, uh, somewhat in the same vein. What really worries me with the, what's happening here is that on the government side. They seem to be rejecting out of hand such an important issue as the protection of our parliamentary privilege. The fact that we have the right to speak in this House and say the truth. And how many among us here have been uh, chewed out <laughs> following the complaints of people across the way for having used terms that were perhaps not quite parliamentary. So this, what we're talking about here, is quite a serious issue. It is a breach of our privilege that a person stand up, make a statement, and as apparently they're saying the truth. And we're not allowed to call someone a liar here. So the insinuation that we are wasting people's time with this debate here, whereas we are talking about what's at the very heart of our privilege. I'd really like to know what my colleague thinks of this. You have a minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. It reminds me, Mr. Speaker, of the early days when uh, a number of us were first elected uh, in the 2008 election. And my colleague from uh, Halifax stood in the place and gave her inaugural speech. And I remember it hit a lot of us very profoundly because she she realized halfway through the speech, and she said she could hear a pin drop, that it suddenly occurred to her that she had the opportunity to stand up here on behalf of her constituents and tell the truth, simply tell the truth, and that the truth would be heard in this place and to all Canadians. That goes to the essence of what should be important in this place. And so when any of us not only don't provide appropriate information, but mislead the House, I think that is a significant matter and merits uh, the attention that we're calling.